Hello once again. In today's video, we're taking a look at another typewriter that I've got here. This is an Olivetti model RT5400, and it was made round about 1993. Uh, I found this in a thrift store a long time ago, almost a year ago now. I found it alongside two other typewriters, the Xerox 6010 Memory Writer and the Brother Fairmont Automatic 12, both of which I've reviewed in videos already. This one's just kind of sitting around, I never got around to reviewing it, but that changes today. And yes, this is a very highly featured typewriter. Um, the first clue to that is that this has a display on it, it's got an LCD display. And indeed, while this isn't advanced enough to be classed as a word processor, this typewriter does have some word processor functionality in it. Unfortunately, I can't go through all the features of this typewriter today because I don't have a manual for this, and I simply cannot figure out how to use some of the features. Uh, this is the most non-user-friendly typewriter I've ever used. Um, even the features I do know how to use, they are so convoluted in how to use them. Unnecessarily complicated. I, I'm not sure why. But anyway, as long as I don't have a manual for this, there are some features that I will not be able to demonstrate. But I will demonstrate what I do know how to use. So being from 1993, this typewriter came from an era when the typewriter was pretty much dead. The personal computer had pretty much completely overtaken the typewriter and the only reason you would have still been buying a typewriter in the early 1990s is if uh, you did not want to cut the complexity of a personal computer or if you need something to write with but you didn't have a lot of money. This would have been a lot cheaper than a personal computer and if you had to write reports for school or work um, this would certainly do the job and be much easier on the budget. Another weird thing about this typewriter is its DNA. This was made by a company called Nakajima, a Japanese company. They've been making typewriters for decades and they are most well known as an OEM for many manufacturers of electronic typewriters. Nakajima made Olivetti's electronic typewriters. They also made AT&T's uh, electronic typewriters. And if I remember right, near the very end of Smith Corona's existence as a typewriter manufacturer from the mid-90s to the mid-2000s, when they had completely phoned it in, um, Smith Corona actually got their last models of typewriters made by Nakajima. Those are the typewriters sold under the Wordsmith series. Uh, apparently those were made not by Smith Corona themselves, but by Nakajima. So Nakajima had a big part, especially in the 90s and 2000s, um, as far as typewriters are concerned. And they're a good manufacturer. Nakajima makes objectively good typewriters. They are good quality and reliable. And this one is no different. So let's take a look at this thing. So you've already seen the LCD display. It is a single line dot matrix display. And it also has enunciators on it for all these functions that you can see up here to let you know if a function is active. Here's the keyboard. There's a lot more keys on it than, for example, the Smith Corona CXL 4200, the first electronic typewriter I reviewed in a video. This one's got a lot more keys because, of course, there's a lot more functions. Down here, there's actually mode and code keys corresponding to secondary and tertiary functions up here. How's the keyboard quality? Uh, much better than what Smith Corona was putting out for their electronic typewriters. Much, much better. Still not, you know, not fantastic. It's just a rubber dome keyboard, but not nearly the deaf, spongy feel uh, that Smith Corona's keyboards are. This, this is a nicer keyboard to type on than that. It's, it's, it's a fine keyboard. You've also got special characters on some of the keys here used in foreign languages. And then you've got keys here for various settings, secondary functions on these keys. This thing is built like a 
the keyboard on this thing is a lot like a really complex scientific calculator that has like three functions for each key. So there's that. Spin it around here. You got a platen knob on each side. There's your power switch down there. Nothing on that side. There's what the back looks like. And if I tip it up, very nice. This thing has a nice little storage compartment for the power cord. Very, very nice. There's the info sticker. Olivetti made in Singapore. 115 volts, 200 milliamps, 60 hertz. You also get a carrying handle that swings up here. Like that. Very nice. And I believe there used to be a cover that goes over this. I didn't get the cover with this, but that's okay. I'll open up the protective lid here to show the business end. So there's your platen. It turns smoothly. There's no ratcheting. This is your paper bale, or I guess you'd call it a paper bale. There's your release. Then if you open this lid up, here you can get to the inner workings. There's your, move this over a bit. There's your print cartridge. I'll take it out here. Uh, this is a standard Nakajima ribbon cartridge. It says Olivetti on it. There you can see it says Olivetti New Light Cart Correctable. This is a standard Nakajima print cartridge. Uh, if you need, have one of these and you need a cartridge for it, just search. Uh, just Google Nakajima ribbon cartridge. These are cheap and plentiful to buy, which is good. But yeah, standard Nakajima print cartridge. This is the um, carbon coated film based ribbon which is nice because it's correctable and here's the correction tape so funny story this the correction tape is not installed correctly here when I got this thing it had no correction tape installed and I bought what I thought was a set of the correct correction tape spools for this thing but they ended up turning out way too big the spools I bought were like this big so obviously not gonna fit so what I, what I ended up doing is taking one of those spools I bought, I bought a set of six of them, I think, and I unraveled the spool and just spun it by hand onto the spindle. So while there's no spool on here, the correction tape is just wound by hand onto the spindle and friction is just keeping it in place. And it friggin' works. So this is what's left, this is what I've used so far, and it works just fine. Um, which which is nice, but there's how your ribbon spools on so it's not a cartridge it's, it's just a spool that you snap in place and it's got a take up spool that snaps in the other reel so that's how that works um, your daisy wheel your print wheel you push this back and your daisy wheel comes out so a reason that I really like this typewriter, and this is actually the typewriter I use the most for real work, I've actually brought this to work and used it when I have to print like uh, key strip labels for our desk phones. Um, I use this thing for that because it doesn't have the standard 10 pitch courier font. It came with this print wheel in it. I have no idea what the font is called, 12SE189, I have no idea what that means, but the important thing is that it's a 12 pitch font, so that means 12 characters per inch instead of 10 characters per inch, so the uh, font is smaller, and for the work that I've used this thing for, that is that has come in very handy. So this thing has been great for that because it's got that smaller size font and I'll show you what that means when we do the typing demonstration. Cartridge just oh, snaps back in. You can kind of see inside there. So the only reason I know when this thing was made is because 
I've actually been inside this thing. I originally went inside this thing to see when, uh, what the manufacture date was, look at date codes on the ICs and such, but I ended up discovering something important. Um, this has, this, ha this has a, a memory, um, it has four point, four and a half kilobytes of memory, um, for the word processing part of this. So, you don't ha you, while you can use this as a conventional typewriter, you can also use it as a word process, a very rudimentary word processor. You can type your, you can do your typing directly into memory, save it to memory, and print it out at a later date. That's really, really cool, and, and I'll show how that works later. Um, but to back up the memory, this has a backup battery in it, and it has, this had one of those blasted Varda NICAD uh, batteries in it, the ones famous for corroding in vintage computers and stuff like that. Now, luckily, the one in this thing was perfect. It wasn't even beginning to corrode, and it still worked just fine. Uh, the first time I ever plugged this thing in, after I bought it at the thrift store, who knows how long this thing was sitting unused before I bought it, it came right up and, and didn't, you know, it, it still had, the memory was still alive. It didn't give the low uh, the low battery uh, warning. So the battery was still perfectly good, but I was really glad that I went inside this thing and saw it because uh, I did decide to replace it. And it's pretty cool. I clipped out that Varda NICAD battery and I decided to try something bold. I replaced it with a 3.5 farad super capacitor. I wanted to see how a super capacitor worked in place of a NICAD backup battery. And so far, it's working fantastic. I've let this thing sit for up to a week and a half so far, and the memory is still alive when I turn it on. It only charges um, when it's turned on. Uh, even when it's plugged in, if it's turned off, it doesn't charge. Um, but yeah, 3.5 farad supercapacitor working really well so far. In fact, people have told me that that was probably overkill. Uh, I probably could have put a 1 farad supercapacitor in this and it would have done the same job perfectly fine. But yeah, took a took out a NICAD Varda battery, replaced it with a supercapacitor, really cool. So for any vintage computer people who uh, still have computers with those batteries in them, I would implore you to try replacing them with a supercapacitor. It works really good. The important thing to do is measure the open circuit voltage uh, applied to the battery terminals without a battery installed. Because while the Varda NICAD batteries are usually 2.4 or 3.6 volts, when I measured the open circuit voltage of this thing without a battery installed, it was a little over 5 volts. So I'm really glad I found that out. Because if I had stuck a, a 2.7 volt supercapacitor in this, it would have burned out. But I opted for a 5.5 volt supercapacitor, and it works perfect in this. And the reason the voltage is so high without the original battery installed is because NICAD and nickel metal hydride batteries use constant current charging, not constant voltage. So uh, when charging those batteries, you don't set a maximum voltage, you just set a current. And in the case of NICAD batteries that can take, you know, a constant trickle charge without damaging them, you just design the circuitry to give the battery uh, a low enough current that such that the battery never overcharges, it never heats up or anything like that. But, and, and you give it a reasonable maximum voltage as well. So people tried to tell me they were like, oh, supercapacitor is not going to work for that because it's going to be pumping current into it all the time. No, that's not the case. In, in the case of an actual NICAD or nickel metal hydride battery, yes because those batteries never reach the open circuit voltage. But in the case of a supercapacitor, as long, you know, as long as you keep pumping current into it, the voltage keeps going up. It never, uh, an ideal capacitor never converts the current going into it into heat. So the voltage just gets higher and higher and higher until it reaches that open circuit voltage, which in this case is just a little over five volts. So stick a 5.5 volt supercapacitor on it, it'll charge up to five volts and that'll, it'll be fine. Some people said, well, maybe you risk burning out the circuitry because it's meant for a 2.4 volt or a 3.6 volt battery. But I figured, you know, if the open circuit voltage is 5 volts, then the circuitry must be able to handle 5 volts because it was working just fine with no battery in it at all. 
um, and so far I haven't had any issue. So yeah, um, NICAD or nickel metal hydride memory backup battery, measure the open circuit voltage, get a super capacitor that can handle at least that voltage, and I think it's a wonderful replacement for those old batteries. It's certainly working well for this. But anyway, that's what I did. So let's turn this thing on. I, I kind of like the uh, startup, or startup sequence this thing has. It, it tests the uh, the carriage and the, and the uh, print wheel rotation mechanism. And it kind of reminds me of a hard drive seek test on an old hard drive. I kind of like it. But we'll turn it on here. So there's that. And on the display, we see a 60. That is a constant display of how many characters before we reach the end margin. The margins by default are set at 10 and 70. Uh, normally I like them set to 10 and 75, but I can't change the margins on this. This does have a margin left and margin right key, and there's a margin release key right there. But uh, they don't do anything. You would think that if I wanted the left margin to be here, for example, that I could just hit margin left and it beeps, but when this thing beeps, it means you've done something wrong that it doesn't accept. And indeed, when I hit return, it goes back to the default left margin. I have no idea, like, <laughs> it's just why why is there a margin left key and setting the margin doesn't involve just hitting the key? It's just whatever the process is for this, it's unnecessarily overcomplicated. And that's a theme with this typewriter is that so many of the functions seem like they should be just a simple one button press, but they are unnecessarily complicated and without the manual, you'll never figure out how to use them. I don't know how to use them. So with no manual for this thing, and no amount of trial and error has ever uh, made anything work for me, I j guess I'll have to be happy with margins at 10 and 70, because I sure can't change them. So, let's stick a piece of paper in and do a bit of typing. So, you have these lines in the back plane here. The leftmost line has this little arrow pointing down, so that's your zero with character, that's your lineup point. And at this point you can just turn the platen, but there's also a paper insert function. So if I do that, it does that lickety split. And kind of a really nice design feature of this thing. Um, there's no paper bale you have to deal with. I mean you get this thing, which I called a paper bale, but it's not really a paper bale. But you don't have to touch anything. It just the paper sort of sorts itself. You just gotta stick it in, hit the paper insert, or just turn the knob, and uh, it goes in and out with ease. Very, very nice. And after that, we can just do some typing. This thing has a very uh, sharp and noisy typing sound. It's, it's a bit noisier and clackier than Smith Corona's mechanisms. And I think by default this thing has auto return set, so when you get to a point, when you get to a point once it beeps to let you know your five characters before the right margin, the next time you hit space it'll start the new line. It's got good buffering so while the carriage is returning you can continue typing and it'll get it. Um, Do a new line here. I'll flip this up so you can take a look. It's got a uh, bold. It's got bold and underline functions. So if you hit code and then bold, so shown here by the bold triple X's, and then underline is the underline triple X's. But I'll hit bold. You can see a little enunciator there, showing that we're in bold mode. And it types each key twice to get a bold effect. And uh, I'll turn bold off. And there's bold versus not bold. 
So, same thing for underline. It types a letter, then it types a uh, underscore. And if you have underline and bold set, then it takes quite a while to uh, type characters. There's that. So the correction feature on this thing, if I make a mistake, I can just hit the correction button. And you can see it types the letter off. Doesn't do the greatest job, but it works well enough. This also has word erase. So if I type, uh, uh, I can erase an entire word if I want. Just hit word erase. So there's that. And this thing actually has line erase, uh, which is kind of funny. So it's the secondary function of the word erase button. So hit code and line erase. And that's going to erase the whole thing. We've got a shift lock here, indicated by a... Uh, is it a shift lock? Yes, it is. It is a shift lock, not a caps lock. Although you do have caps lock as a secondary function, but you get this little light on. It flashes when you're in caps lock mode, and then you just hit shift. Oh. Do I have to do code caps lock again? I guess so. When you're in shift lock, you just hit shift, and it unlocks it, just like a mechanical typewriter. That's what it's emulating there. Um, you can do subscripts and superscripts, so, for example, if I wanted to write x squared, I could type x, and do code super, and then hit 2, and it brings it right back when it's done, so I've written x squared, and uh, same for subscripts, if I want to do x of a, sub a, so there you see superscripts and subscripts. This has text centering. So let's start a new line here. If I do code center and start typing, center, and it shows it on the display here. And then I hit return. So there's that. And you might be able to see, again, that 12-pitch font is a little bit of a smaller font than the standard 10-pitch courier font, which is very nice for what I use this thing for, which is to make, I've been using this at work to make uh, telephone uh, key strip labels. It's, it's worked really nice for that. The right flush function justifies the text towards the right. You have to activate it for every line that you want it on. So if I hit code right flush, you type into the display, this is right flush, and then hit return. It is justified towards the right. So this also has a built-in dictionary, and it can automatically detect if it thinks you've misspelled something. By default, it's turned off, but if you press mode, Spell check, turns a little enunciator on, right there, and we're now in spell check mode. So I can start typing, start typing, and let's say I misspell typing, it beat twice, it says, hey, I, th I think you spelled something wrong there. So when you're in the word processing mode, there's more you can do with the spelling, but when you're in the normal typewriter mode, that's it. So you just, it beeps at you, you notice that you spelled something wrong, and then you can correct it. Just like that. And keep on going. So how do you change the typing mode, like your uh, text pitch, your line spacing, auto return, stuff like that? Well, you would think, you've got buttons right here, you've got pitch, spacing, uh, it would, you would think that you just hit these, 
and it does it. But no, that's not correct. Uh, you can't do that. Of course, this thing needs to make it a little more convoluted. You hit this key status, and the display, oh, you gotta be quick. The display shows you these settings. Actually, I'm gonna do a return here. The carriage has to be at the far left or you won't be able to change the settings. There, now it's staying on. So when you hit the status button, you have two options you can set here. Uh, the typing mode and auto return. By default, auto return is off. Um, you can turn it on and then once you uh, get to five characters before the right margin and it beeps, uh, the next time you hit the space bar, it'll automatically return. Mode is whether this functions like a normal typewriter or there's another mode where you can type an entire line into the memory onto the display and so that way you don't, you know, if you make mistakes or want to change something, you have the chance to do that before it actually goes onto the paper and you use your ribbon and you don't have to use your correction tape, stuff like that. So CC here is the normal mode. I have no idea what CC stands for. But uh, the little underscore here shows that we're currently changing this mode. So if you press return, it goes to LL. That's the mode where you can type an entire line and then it prints. And then there's RTJ. RTJ is just like LL, except uh, it'll print the line justified, which is really cool. So when you've made your choice, uh, you can hit this key, TPWR, that just means typewriter. So I'll, I'll show the uh, justified memory typing mode. So in order for this to work, you have to let it auto-return. If you hit return early, it's not going to justify that line. But uh, I'm one-handed here, so I'll just type a bunch of gibberish. And you can see there's quite a bit of spacing between the words because it took up the entire width of the printable area. Very nice. So that's options you can get with the status key. There's also this key down here, line form, and that's how you get to the other options. So when you press line form, you can choose your pitch and line spacing. So it's, uh, in this case, if I press the pitch button, I can choose 10, 12, or 15. This is a 12 pitch font, but of course you can use whatever pitch you want. 15 you can really squeeze the uh, letters together and you can buy 15 pitch print wheels uh, they're called micro fonts they're just super tiny if you want to squeeze a ton of text into a small space hit line form again when you're done and of course in 15 pitch mode we have 90 characters to a line uh, this is 15 pitch So you can see quite crammed together there. I'll put that back to 10 pitch. And it just occurred to me, you've probably been staring at this self demo sticker and really hoping that I activate the self demo. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna do that. Let me put a fresh piece of paper in and we'll see what the self demo looks like on this thing. So we've got our piece of paper in, you've got to put it in and, and get it queued up before you turn it on. And then we hold down the 1 and 2 keys and turn the power on.
those are keys I accidentally hit after uh, turning it on. So there you go. Man, what a racket this thing makes. But I'll, uh, I'll read its song here to you. Hi, I'm your new electronic typewriter with a display and memory. I have programs which manage text and check spelling and grammar. You can store up to nine texts in my memory, about 4,500 characters. You can then recall these texts and correct them electronically on the 22 character display before printing them. I write underlined and bold characters, align decimal numbers in columns, and automatically draw frame center text and make a perfect right margin. With my help you'll obtain perfect documents in the most simple and enjoyable of ways. Try me, we'll soon be great friends. Ah, uh, how nice. And notice how there's no mention of the Olivetti name in this. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if this is the exact same self-demo that Nakajima puts in their own typewriters that they sell under their own name. Oh, and the whole draw frames thing, uh, yeah, that's one of the functions I've never been able to figure out, so you'll just have to imagine what that might look like. So that's the gist of the typewriter functions with this thing. Uh, let's take a look at the word processing functions. So to get into the text memory, you press mode, text memory, and you have nine different slots that you can store text in. I already have something in slot number one, which is why it has the underline there, and it says how much memory is free, 4.2K in this case. So to view text that I've already written here, just press the number that it's stored in, so I'm gonna hit one, and this is just the junk file that I've typed a bunch of random crap in. And then this is where it gets weird. You would think from here that we can view the text or print it or whatever we want, but for some reason, after we get into the text, we have to press mode, modify text. Even though we're not modifying it, we just want to view it. We have to do this for some reason. I don't know why. Um, it shows these weir weird characters on the screen in the beginning. And then it shows this. And I'm hitting the scroll button here. This is a thing I wrote the day I changed the uh, memory battery for the supercapacitor so I could remember what day I put it in so I could see how long it lasted. Um, if you want to go to the beginning of the text, you can hit mode and then right here where it says up arrow mem, that means the beginning of memory, so go to the beginning of the text. And there we're back in the beginning. If I want to get to the end, I can hit mode and then the down arrow mem, which means bottom of the memory. And there's the end of the memory. I can hit backspace to see what's going on going back, or the scroll key to go forward. So if I want to print this, um, I need to first go to the beginning of the memory, because it prints from uh, wherever the cursor currently is. And then I hit this button, print. Oops, I forgot to go to Modify Text. There, go to Modify Text. We're already at the beginning of the text, and then I hit Print. And it says, RTJ Print, yes or no? If you remember earlier in the video, RTJ means the Justified Mode. Um, so we can print it Justified, or just print it normally. Um, if we hit, hey, hitting no doesn't mean don't print it. It means don't print it Justified, and it's going to print it normally. So uh, we'll hit. We'll, we'll go ahead and hit yes and print it justified. So, oh, so this, this is where I hit return. So it doesn't justify lines where you hit return. It only does, it only justifies lines that were auto returned. And there must have been a space, an extra space before the H there, which is why it's not lined up at the left. Um, but you can see the extra space is there, because it justified it. So that's viewing and printing a text document from memory. Um, if I want to make a new text document, I'll go text memory, I'll store this in slot 2. Then you want to hit mode and modify text. Um, you can start punching in text at this point. But for some reason, if you don't do mode modify text, um, it'll save to memory. But anytime you hit return, or if you try to exit the text memory mode, 
it'll print whatever you've typed. So I'm just going to hit mode, modify text, and then I can start typing. I can hit return, stores returns. I can hit tabs, stores a tab, shows represents a tab with that character, stuff like that. And then when I'm done typing and I just want to store what I've typed into memory, I hit code and then on the return key here is exit test. So I'm going to hit code, exit text, and you can see we now have text stored in the number two slot. And I can hit two, then hit modify text because you need to do that for anything. And then I can scroll through or backspace and see what I've made. Just like that. And uh, it's battery backed and and uh, you can just, you can store, you can write whatever in uh, relative silence and then print it whatever you want. That's pretty cool functionality. It's just too bad everything beyond the bare basics with this typewriter is so unnecessarily complicated to do. But anyway, um, that's really about it for this thing. I've shown you pretty much everything I know how to do. If you're using it as a basic typewriter, it's great. And it's got some really great functionality, but without a manual, no way to know how to use it. But that's about it for the Olivetti RT5400 electronic typewriter from 1993. It is a nice, unique typewriter. It certainly works just fine. It's great that it uses Nakajima consumables, because those are really easy to come by. And not too expensive. And this one's been uh, nice for me to use, because it has that 12-pitch font. I'm not terribly fond of this thing, um, but it's been extremely useful and that's why I've kept it around. But, I have another electronic typewriter, uh, a word processor actually, that uh, I'll be showing in a future video. And I recently bought a 12 pitch print wheel for that word processor. So now I'll be able to use that word processor, which I like much more, instead of using this thing. I'll be able to do the same jobs that I've been using this thing for. But there you go. That's a look at this very unique and, and quirky typewriter. I do hope you enjoyed, and I'll see you in the next video.